So, hello and welcome to the UCD School of Agriculture and Food Science seminar series. Um, my name is Barry McMahon and I will be your chair for the seminar this afternoon. This is the ninth seminar that we have had in the current series and it's the seventh year that we've been running these seminars and these seminars essentially give us an opportunity to hear about and discuss the current research activity across the various research teams within the School of Agriculture and Food Science. So you're very welcome this afternoon. And before we start, I'd just like to run through a couple of housekeeping issues for you. This session will be recorded and will be available uh, for you on the school YouTube channel at UCD Ag Food. Today's presentation will take approximately 35 minutes and there will be an additional 10 minutes of questions. I would invite uh, participants to submit questions through the Q&A um, as the, the chat function has been disabled for today. So I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker this afternoon, uh, Dr. Helen Sheridan from the UCD School of Agriculture and Food Science. Um, so Helen has a B.Agri Science in Agriculture and Environmental Science from UCD. She did her PhD as a Walsh Fellow uh, in conjunction with the School of Agriculture and Food Science in Johnstown Castle. After that, she followed up with postdoctoral research on two projects related to agricultural ecology in uh, related to ag biota and uh, agri baseline. And she is presently a lecturer in farm landscape ecology and agri environmental policy. In addition, Dr. Sheridan is the director of the Bachelor of Agricultural Science, uh, Agriculture and Environmental Science. So in relation to Dr. Sheridan's research activities, her interests relate to the role of multi-species grasslands in agricultural systems. Secondly, she's interested in the design and implementation of agri-environmental measures. And finally, uh, Dr. Sheridan is interested in the identification, classification and management of habitats in rural landscape. So I'm delighted to invite Helen to, to give her seminar on biodiversity in agricultural systems. So over to you, Helen. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much for the introduction, Barry, and thank you to the, the research committee for inviting me here today to speak. Um, I'll just share my screen with you now. Okay, so. Okay, so I'm here today to talk about biodiversity in our agricultural systems. And I guess looking at landscapes like this, it's important to recognize that these landscapes have really formed as a consequence of 6,000 years of agriculture coupled with the climatic conditions and underlying geology. So all of those factors are, are inextricably linked and result in the landscapes and the biodiversity within those landscapes that we have today. Unfortunately, I suppose when we look at the, the headlines regarding biodiversity, it's there, but for the wrong reasons an awful lot of the time. Certainly when we look at reports at a global scale like the Living Planet Report or the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and they have recognised that we are currently going through what they regard as the sixth mass extinction. Such is the rate at which we are losing species um, from, from ecosystems right around the world. The uh, World Wildlife Fund have reported during the period between 1970 and about 2014, a 60% decrease in vertebrate wildlife populations. And we know that we have altered, we as humans have altered the, the uh, land surface, global land surface very significantly. Bringing that closer to home from a European perspective, there, there, are, uh, there are research papers that suggest that we have lost about 23% of biodiversity from European agricultural landscapes over the last number of decades. And again, even from an Irish perspective, uh, certainly there are estimates of losses in, in the 
order of about 17% in terms of bumblebee populations and 6% in terms of butterflies since even since 2012. So it's, it's right across the world. It comes to our own doorstep. And there are many other figures that one could give uh, about it, but just to, to highlight that. Um, I guess it's important also to remember where we as humans sit in all of this. So this uh, this time coil, as it's referred to, reflects the the, the lifespan of the Earth and the, and the various periods, uh, geological periods, etc., are are reflected within it. Um, we can see that the the Earth is estimated to be about four point six billion years old, with life beginning on it sometime around three billion years ago. But I think the most important fact to take from this is this person sitting right at the edge of time as it were and that's modern human uh, modern humans so we estimate that they've been around for only about the last one to two hundred thousand years something in the order of that and yet humans as a species have had an enormous impact on probably most other species on the face of the planet at this stage so, um, you know, it's, it's important to, to recognise that, that we are only one species and yet our impact has been enormous. I guess, why do we, uh, why are we concerned about biodiversity? Um, why should we bother about it? You know, it, it, a lot of us think it's, it's not terribly important in our everyday lives. And of course, it is in the sense that firstly, we have a moral obligation to prevent species from going extinct uh, and to prevent activities that we're engaged in that might drive species in that direction. There's also a legal obligation, but none of those capture the imagination, I find, as well as uh, this type of representation here, where we look at the ecosystem services that are provided through nature and fundamentally through biodiversity. And of course, we're, we're pretty familiar with the provisioning ecosystem services, particularly within an agricultural sense, because those are the services that we have tended to focus on. And food production obviously is a key ecosystem service from agricultural production systems as it should be. However, which uh, those which are maybe less obvious to us in our day-to-day -day lives are the regulating and supporting services that tend to go on in the background. So I'm talking about nutrient cycling, for example, and soil formation, pollination, water regulation. All of these services are fundamental to us as human society, but also fundamental to some sustainable agricultural systems. Um, and I think our awareness of that is growing uh, and that we're recognizing the importance of delivering these ecosystem services and, and our landscapes delivering them. We're, we're, we're growing in terms of our understanding of it and, and our appreciation of it. However, it is challenging because I guess the, the services where we have transactions and we have money changing hands tend to be in the, the area of food uh, or medicinal resources. So those provisioning services, we don't tend to pay for pollination services or for soil formation services. Now, in an attempt to overcome that challenge, because often people don't necessarily value what they're not paying financially for. The, the World Wildlife Fund have estimated a value of these ecosystem services of somewhere in the region of $125 trillion per year. And of course, uh, we have what are called keystone species. So keystone species are species that are particularly important. Um, and without them, entire ecosystems can collapse. Now, somebody asked me at one stage, why don't we just hang on to the biodiversity that we need and forget about the rest? But now, of course, morally that's wrong. But aside from the moral issue, if we look at it from a purely human centric perspective, you know, we don't always know what those keystone species are before they're gone. So we can't, we know 
a limited amount about how species interact with each other and particularly how they interact to deliver these ecosystem services to us. Um, so it is in our own best interests as a species to try and preserve and protect as much biodiversity as we possibly can. In terms of what's out there uh, to protect biodiversity in a legal sense, we have the Convention, that's uh, the Convention on Biodiversity, which Ireland is a signatory to, along with, I think it's about 180 countries at this stage worldwide. Um, and that has committed to halting the loss of biodiversity. We also, at a European scale, have the Birds and Habitats Directive and the network of, of Natura nature sites, um, special protection areas and special areas of conservation designated under those directives that aim to, to try to help prevent further loss of, of biodiversity and protect what's currently existing. Then we have the Agri-Environmental Regulation, of course, as well, which was passed in 1992. And as a consequence of that, we have had the introduction of Agri-Environment Schemes since that time period. And then more closely to home, we have the, the Wildlife Act that was our national act in terms of protecting uh, various components of biodiversity here. And that was originally introduced in, in 1976. So we do have that legal framework, I guess, to try and help us protect biodiversity. But I guess what I find is, um, is, is more useful is not necessarily to tell people that you legally must do this, although there is an element of that. But if people understand how important this, these species are potentially within our lives, then I think they'll be much more willing and, and, and have a greater interest in protecting them. And I think that, you know, it, it's about recognising the importance of them. Now, we're particularly lucky here. We have this type of, I, I'm showing a fairly typical agricultural landscape, an image of a fairly typical agricultural landscape here. And we've retained a lot of diversity within it. Um, even from this image, you can see that we're particularly lucky to have an extensive network of hedgerows right throughout our country, uh, but also air areas of, of scrub and woodland and forestry. And, and while we don't have much native woodland left, at least we do have that network of hedgerows as a, you know, as a kind of a surrogate woodland habitat. However, we wanted to see, and part of my own research revolved around wanting to see where exactly we stood in terms of farm scale habitat levels. Um, and, and Barry mentioned I had undertaken two postdocs and they largely revolved around this work. So in the first one was a, an EPA funded project, uh, Agbiota, where we looked at 50 farms based in the east and southeast of the country and undertook farm scale habitat surveys on those. And then subsequently Agri Baseline, which was the Department of Agriculture funded project. And that was 118 farms and they were split evenly between Sligo Leitrim, Offaly Leash and North Cork. So in total, we surveyed over 6,000 hectares of farmland to, to see what kind, firstly, what types of habitats were present, how much of them was present on farms and what kind of quality or ecological condition they were in. And I suppose by way of explanation of why we're looking at farmland habitats, it's, it's hugely expensive and time consuming to try and look at many components of biodiversity and, and it's very, you know, very high level of skill required for some of the identification work that would be involved. So uh, farmland habitats would give us potentially a good indicator of how uh, ecologically healthy, I guess, our, our farmlands are, because if the habitats aren't there, the species won't be there and vice versa. So we undertook these habitat surveys and subsequently then I digitised uh, the, the farm ha habitat types and land use types onto these aerial photos and, and calculate, calculated the area of the individual habitat types. So just to, to give some context to where we are in an Irish sense, and, um, and I'm talking about 
when I talk about semi-natural habitat here, I'm talking about our hedgerows, our field margins, areas of scrub, streams, those kind of areas. And on average, uh, the farms that I included or we walked within the service, we found about a 13% uh, le level of semi-natural habitats on, on these farms. That compares pretty well to Caroline Sullivan's work in East Galway, where she found about 15% semi-natural habitat. And then Julie Larkin, who is a PhD student with John Finn and Dara Hulikon and myself, um, found that on more intensively managed farms and those also including tillage farms within that, the, the other uh, data sets look just at grass-based farms. So when we bring tillage farms into it and more intensively managed farms, we're still in around 10% of semi-natural habitat area. And when we compare this with what's known from other countries, we see that Ireland is actually, you know, comparing reasonably well. If we look at the Netherlands, we have an area of somewhere between two and, and five percent there is the estimate. France, someplace between two and twelve percent, depending on the region, and Poland, someplace between one and four percent. So on the face of it, that looks positive, and it is positive. We have retained a lot of these habitats within our landscape, a lot of area of it. However, there are issues. Um, that need to be recognised and certainly around the quality of some of our most common uh, semi-natural habitats such as our field boundaries or our hedgerows. Um, so this graph here is just showing how the, the percentage breakdown into different field boundary types of the 253 kilometres that were surveyed across the Agbiota 50 farms. And we see from that that somewhere around 45% of the field boundaries, the hedgerows, would be regarded as stock proof, which a stock proof hedge is similar to the one that I'm showing there in the top right of your screen. Um, but about 50% of the hedges were either regarded as escaped or relict. So escaped is where a hedge is becoming gappy and where it needs a fairly significant in intervention such as coppicing or laying to try and rejuvenate it. And then relict is where the white thorn, if it's a white thorn hedge, have, have essentially just become white thorn th trees and it's lost its function as a hedgerow. Now those relict and escaped hedges are still important for biodiversity, but the hedge is dying out at that stage. Um, so we will lose them if we don't intervene. Um, so there's certainly work that needs to be done on our, our field boundaries in terms of improving the quality of them. And also, if we think beyond biodiversity and, and into the whole area of carbon sequestration and people are getting interested in the potential of our hedgerows to store carbon and sequester carbon, um, there's limited work available on that at the moment. But uh, looking at work undertaken in the UK, there's an estimated storage capacity above ground of somewhere between 32 and 40 tonnes of carbon per hectare and below ground something similar. And then uh, from the limited work that is available here, the sequestration rate for carbon in terms of our hedgerows will be somewhere between uh, two thirds of a tonne and 3.3 tonnes of CO2 per hectare per year. However, there's a lot of work required in that area to tie those figures down. They are uh, estimates at this stage, and I believe Chagas are doing some work in that area at the moment. So hopefully we'll be able to, 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 to give more detailed reports on that in the future. But the point being that we need hedges to be growing vigorously and to be sequestering that carbon, um, as well as from the, the biodiversity perspective. The other area I wanted to mention with regard to habitat quality were field margins and field margins are this area of herbaceous vegetation adjacent to a field boundary and they represent ecotones if you like. So those are areas, transitional areas uh, between two adjacent ecological communities. So in this case between the, the, the hedgerow which represents uh, like a linear woodland and then grassland areas. So we expect those areas, those field margin areas to be more diverse. Um, 
And of course, while a lot of the species that you may find in them are not necessarily rare species, the areas that are available for them to continue existing on farmland are becoming increasingly restricted unless we manage our, our field margins in a way that helps to promote them and allow them to, to, to continue to exist there. Um, so when we looked at the quality of the field margins again on the 50 farm survey, we found that about 50% of them would be regarded uh, classified as kind of grass and herb dominated. And that's the kind of category we want to see in there. Um, I, there's one example shown there again on the top right of your screen. Um, I would like to see more herbs, more flowering plants in it. But at least, you know, if we get the rough grasses in there with some herbs, that's certainly positive. But then the remainder of them, so another 50% or so of them, were made up of what would be regarded as unde undesirable in this context. So uh, bramble and gorse encroaching onto them, um, nutrient responsive species. So you can see in the, the bottom picture on your screen there that there's uh, the margin dominated by nettle. So oftentimes you get nettle or cleaver where you get high levels of nutrient um, it, nutrients encroaching into the field margin habitat. So hugely important that we try to keep those nutrients out of the margins to allow these species to continue to, to grow there, these ones that we want to see there. So certainly on the, you know, we've retained a lot, but there's certainly more work to be done in terms of addressing quality issues. When we look at that overall, um, the kind of picture we we're getting was that about 73% of our farmland area is under agriculturally productive habitats. And that's what you'd expect, um, you know, that we would have a high level of those. About 11% of land area would be regarded as marginally productive. So, you know, you might be talking about wet grasslands there, they can be semi-natural grasslands, but they are used for agricultural purposes. Uh, and then about 13% that would be semi-natural habitat area that isn't used for agricultural purposes like hedgerows um, and woodland areas, for example, in scrub. So, as I say, we compare quite favourably, but when we look at the breakdown of that across the different regions of the country, this is where we, we need to be quite careful, I think, for the future in terms of our planning. There is a significant relationship there in terms of system and also region. So we're getting reduced levels of the marginal and semi-natural habitat types as we move into dairy and beef systems and also as we move from north to south. So we're getting a much higher proportion in Sligo Leitrim, lower proportion in, in, in Cork. And again, that reflects the ability of the land, I suppose, to, to produce a high levels of agricultural output in, in Cork. Um, we use that information then to undertake a remotely sensed um, classification of, of habitats of the landscape at a much wider scale. And doing that, we classified a total of about 87,000 hectares of land using this approach. And again, we see that, that reflected at a landscape scale, you know, that we're getting a much higher proportion of agriculturally very productive land in areas like Cork than we are in, in Sligo Leitrim. And, and again, that reflects natural constraints on land, etc. But I guess what's important to keep in mind here is that we need to retain at least minimum levels of, of, of areas for biodiversity, even in our most productive landscapes and plan for that. Um, so, you know, we I think we, we need to uh, manage and, and ensure that we retain those habitat areas going forward and potentially enhance our habitats in certain parts of the country as well. And when we look at this map, which shows the predicted level of high nature value farmland in our landscape, um, you can see that the, the predicted le high level nature value farmland occurs uh, showing the areas where it's predicted to occur are shown in green, 
whereas the blue predicts areas where you're going to find low levels of this high nature value farmland. And that really reflects, I suppose, what I've been talking about there for the last few minutes. But I think we need to be very conscious of this in terms of planning for land use and addressing environmental concerns, particularly around climate issues. There's been a lot of talk about how we're going to address our, our climate uh, requirements under the, the Paris Agreement, for example. Um, and we need to keep in mind, I think, that we have a climate and a biodiversity crisis. And we can't afford for any policy initiatives or land use change that might be coming down the road to, to um, address one issue, but potentially exacerbate another. So I guess it's just a, a word of caution that we need to plan for, for any changes and ensure that we're not replacing any particular, particularly valuable habitat types or rare habitat types with those of, of a lower ecological value. So it's getting the balance between the two. From a grassland perspective, and I kind of dealt with the, the landscape there, uh, now to, to turn our attention to the in-field uh, aspect of biodiversity. And I guess that picture on the, the top left of your screen there shows uh, the dairy farm in Johnstown when I started my PhD down there. And it's very much the kind of I suppose, system that we've been working towards or research been working towards um, high output system um, and, and dominated by perennial ryegrass. And there's very good reasons for this. I mean, ryegrass is highly productive. Um, you know, it has the potential to germinate very well and recover very well following defoliation. So there's very good reasons for, for, for sowing perennial ryegrass and, you know, um, having these high output systems, agricultural output systems. However, I suppose the elephant in the room is that they're going to be highly dependent on nitrogen fertilizer. And you see the consequence, I suppose, as you move towards the right of your screen there, in terms of reducing nitrogen fertilizer levels, what, you know, that does to botanical diversity within sward, certainly the image in the centre there, you're going to get a much greater diversity of grass species and some herb species in there as well. And then, of course, uh, a high proportion of our agricultural land would also be kind of wet, rushy land as well. So I suppose these three types in particular that I'm showing in the images here um, are, make up a high proportion of our agricultural grasslands in Ireland currently. And then we have, I suppose, those grasslands that are more important from a biodiversity perspective, but their agricultural output from them will be much reduced, certainly than the, the first two that I talked about. So, you know, your calcareous species rich grasslands on the bottom left there. In the middle, that's an image I took of the Shannon Callow, so wet seasonally flooded grasslands, and then on the right, uh, an acid grassland, which may on the face of it not seem that botanically diverse, but you can have a very high level of, uh, of um, wax cap species uh, and fungal species in, in general, which reflect the biological diversity within the soil in those areas. So if you put nitrogen or any other fertilizer indeed onto those sites, you're going to interfere with that biodiversity. So we need to be very cautious to try and continue to mind and ensure that we have retain what is left of those areas. Uh, and that means not intensifying them, but it also means not abandoning them, because abandonment and lack of farming in those areas will be equally detrimental as, as intens intensification will be for biodiversity. And of course, I'm showing you the plant diversity here, but of course that in turn supports a wide range of invertebrates and a range of bird species, et cetera, et cetera. So where are we currently? Well, you know, the EU farmed fork um, shows that we're, we're targeting a reduction of 20% in terms of our fertilizer usage by 2030. Um, so the challenge for us, I guess, on our highly productive land is going to be 
to balance that productivity with a lowering of inputs into those systems, a lowering of, of particularly our nitrogen fertilizers into them. So one of the areas that I've been working with uh, a number of my colleagues here in UCD and, and elsewhere on over the last number of years has been multi-species grasslands. And these are not to be confused with species rich grasslands. These are highly productive, uh, modified uh, agricultural grasslands that consist of maybe six to 10, 12 species. Um, but you know, they're, they're grown for their agricultural productivity mm. primarily. And what we're doing with those, growing them together, um, it, 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 I suppose the theory behind it is that when you grow species together, they're going to use resources more efficiently, be that above ground or below ground. And also that some species can help facilitate the growth of others. So prime example there would be of legume species, uh, fixing atmospheric nitrogen and making that available to other species. Okay, so our work in this area began with Smart Grass, which was a, a project funded by the Department of Agriculture. And we started with the establishment of a plot experiment where we're looking at different species, one to nine different species grown uh, from three different functional groups. So that included perennial ryegrass, timothy, coxfoot, chicory, plantain, yarrow, and then in legumes, red clover, white clover, and bird's foot trefoil. And we grew those species in mixtures of one to nine, so either monoculture or up to nine species grown together at different nitrogen input levels. And we also grew a conventional perennial ryegrass control at two, receiving 250 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. So over the course of the following years, we monitored dry matter yields from those plots and also the, the um, proportion of the dry matter coming from different species. And this is coming from Connie Grace's work here. But um, so what you're seeing on the right hand side of the screen there is what the plots were sown with and, and these colours summarise the different mixtures that we included. So for example, if you see a uh, 60-20-20, that was sown with 60% grass, 20% legume and 20% herb. Um, so it could have been any combination of the species from those functional groups making up those proportions. What's interesting, if you look at this particular graph, this is the effect of, of nitrogen on annual herbage production from the, the plots. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see across the x-axis that nitrogen input is increasing and then on the y-axis is the, the kilograms of dry matter and the dotted black line shows the yields from the uh, the perennial ryegrass monocultures receiving 250 kgn. So what we're seeing is that a number of our mixtures are actually performing really well by comparison to that even when they're receiving zero nitrogen input and once they receive about 90 kgn they're outperforming it um, and that's really down to the, the largely down to the legume component of those swords driving that. Um, looking at it from a seasonal perspective again all of these graphs follow a similar train of uh, with the dotted line showing the, the conventional ryegrass control. And again, you can see in spring, a number of our mixtures were performing well at zero N relative to the, the perennial ryegrass. Um, summer ryegrass comes into its own, but yet we did still have, have uh, mixtures that were, were performing as well as it. And then in the autumn, we also see that it's performing. So, that the mixtures are performing. So we're seeing that performance maintained right throughout the growing season and overall. If we look at what happens to our the composition of our dry matter when we change the nitrogen input levels. So just looking at this purple line at the top, this was a mixture that was shows, sorry, big farm sown with 40% grass, 60% legume. And when we look at the dry matter from that at zero end, we see that 28% of it comes from the grass component and 70% from the legume component. When we increase the nitrogen fertilizer input, we're seeing an increase in the, the grass component of the dry matter, uh, but a decrease in the legume component, but we're not getting any yield increase. 
as a, as a consequence of that increased nitrogen input. Similarly, if we look at other examples, we, with some of them, we do get a yield response from the mixture, but I guess that's where people have to decide, is that yield response enough to make them put on or apply the additional nitrogen that's required to, to achieve it. Um, and to a large degree, we're seeing that shift from uh, a legume and her, a legume, um, high legume content dry matter to a lower legume, higher grass dry matter content when we increase the, the nitrogen input. Um, in terms of weed invasion, we're concerned about this because we can't apply many of our, our um, post-emergent sprays to multi-species grasslands. Um, I guess it's going to be site specific, I think, and if you have a weed problem in, your, in the area that you're sowing under a ryegrass, you'll have it if you put it under multi-species too, I think. Um, we didn't have any great weed issue uh, with our plots, as you can see from this graph here. The, the green line at the top there that's dipping off as nitrogen is increasing, that's actually the, the legume component jumping from our, our legume uh, containing spores into the ryegrass monoculture. So it was an unsown species within the, the um, ryegrass monoculture, so we had to regard it as, as a weed uh, in that instance. But um, as I say, I think it's, it's going to be site specific in terms of that issue. And moving on, there was a farmlet experiment established, and this was the work of, of Connie Grace again, together with Tommy Boland and Bridget Lynch. Um, and, and this was established to see how you know animals would respond if they were fed the different sward types. So there were four sward types were established in farmlets at the, the back of Lions Hill. One was a ryegrass monoculture receiving 163 kgn per hectare heat per year. Then we had ryegrass and white clover receiving 90, uh, and then a six species and the nine species mix, each receiving 90. And I'm, I'm just touching on the results here. This is a story for another day, and Tommy can tell this story a lot better than I can. So, uh, but just to highlight a couple of things from it in terms of animal performance. So the number of days required to reach the target slaughter weight, the, the lambs that were on the legume and legume herb containing swords finished about two weeks earlier than those on the higher N input perennial ryegrass swords. In addition, um, you know, the, there seemed to be a health response in terms of the animals. So there was a lowering of uh, fetal eggs within uh, egg counts. So the number of anthelmintics required by the animals was also significantly reduced on these more diverse swords. And that's particularly important as we see increasing levels of resistance to conventional um, uh, anthelmintics. Um, so it's important to see. I suppose we do have issues that we need to learn more about in terms of persistence of the species and how to manage them best for persistence. And we see different responses from different species depending on whether they're cut or whether they're grazed. And that's across the grasses uh, and also the herbs we're seeing that. Um, I guess what I can say when we manage these, and from this experiment here in particular, we manage these plots as uh, ryegrass plots. So what we have learned is that we're not going to get great persistence from them, certainly when we were manage them as a, a ryegrass ward. Um, so we, we really have to learn how best to manage them to try and enhance that persistence of the species. In addition, then looking at uh, the wider diversity within them, uh, work with myself and, and Olaf Schmidt here, uh, looking at the earthworms within the plots, um, seeing that where we've got grass and legumes growing and also the legume herbs, we get an increased level of earthworm biomass from the plots. Again, that relationship is also reflected. There's a grass and legume interaction there. Um, a significant one in terms of abundance of earthworms recorded as well. Work by Asad Schnell uh, showed that when he looked at earthworm surface casts, 
uh, as an indicator of earthworm activity within the sward types, we found reduced cast counts on the simpler sward types. And this is reflected in reduced, or we also record, um, measured water infiltration rates across a subset of the plots as well. And again, we see a similar, um, I suppose, response in terms of water infiltration uh, rates to the different sward types. Um, and indeed, he found a, a strong, significantly positive relationship between earthworm activity in the plots and infiltration rates. So that has led us to the establishment of UCD Lions long-term grazing platform. Um, and this is a platform that has been established uh, largely down to the vision of our head of school um, to address a lot of the long-term challenges and big issues that we have in agriculture around biodiversity, soil fertility, water quality, um, but to allow us to look at those issues in the longer term. And it's a site that's also a participant site within the Global Farm Platform now. So the first project on this the, the platform is SmartSword, which has been funded by the Department of Agriculture. And we're working on that in conjunction with all of these uh, partners that are listed. And here we have three farmlets that have been established in 2019. So we have a high input, a, a high end input perennial ryegrass monoculture, ryegrass and white clover, and then one of our best performing multi-species mixes. And we've stocked that at a stocking rate of 2.5 livestock units per hectare under a dairy calved beef system. And we're measuring uh, the, the performance of the sward, the performance of the animals. And of course, I'm very hesitant to, to give any definitive answers of based on one year's data, but we are seeing similar yields across the treatment types. Sorry, sorry. Um, but those yields are on the ryegrass, sorry, on the perennial ryegrass and white clover and our multi-species swards are being achieved at less than half the nitrogen input that the yields on the perennial ryegrass monocultures are coming from. So we're also involved in a project uh, with Devonish Nutrition and Wageningen University called Heartland. It's a, an EU Marie Curie funded project. And that is, we have four sword types there. So perennial ryegrass monoculture again. In this instance, we have a permanent pasture, a six species mix and a 12 species mix. And in this case, we're looking at co-grazing of cattle and sheep. And this is, work that's been undertaken, um, the data here by um, Jane Shackleton as part of her PhD. Uh, and again, you can see the different yields for 2020 coming from those different sward types. Um, and certainly our six and our 12 species mixes seem to be performing very well. Although I am, again, you know, uh, hesitant to, to make any definite statements about one year's data. It's just to give an indicator of where we are. So I'm back to this image of, of our landscape again and our agricultural landscape and of course food production is a key output from that landscape and should be a key output from it. However, I suppose we're increasingly understanding that to, you know, allow us to continue producing that food in a sustainable manner, we also need the provision of a range of other ecosystem services. So they fundamentally underpin our ability to produce food um, to a greater or lesser extent. And the provision of those ecosystem services is largely dependent on the retention of biodiversity within our landscape, be it at field scale, at landscape scale, at farm scale, all of these different scales, there are different things we can do to try and address that need. Um, we as a society, I believe, are, are looking more and more for the evidence that we are, are providing these ecosystem services and that we are managing land in a, a manner that will allow that to happen. And I guess we just have to be careful that um, we remember that Food production is really the only one of these ecosystem services that farmers get paid for. Um, so where we are calling on them for enhanced production of other ecosystem services, we have to ensure that they can, can make a living from those landscapes and that they're sufficiently rewarded for the provision of those ecosystem services on which 
society ultimately depends. Okay, that's all from me for now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen, for a really interesting uh, presentation with a nice integration of uh, of scales there, talking from a farm scale habitat approach, looking at some and then bringing it down to the infield challenges that we face. There's a couple of questions in, but I suppose I'm just going to start 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 off with a, a question that I have in relation to this. So there's been a, basically an obliteration of biodiversity across the globe, including Europe, over the last, say, 30 years. So you look at the, the Living Planet Index. But during that time period, that's coincided with agri-environmental scheme development, which has been very positive and all the rest. But why hasn't it been as effective or have you any views on that, uh, the role that it that agri-environment schemes have had or haven't had in relation to, to dealing with those challenges? Yeah, so um, I mentioned the introduction of the agri-environment regulation, which has since 1992 required us as an EU member state to have agri-environment schemes in place for our farmers to participate in. It's left up to every member state to determine what their agri-environment scheme will look like. And I guess Ireland is not alone um, when I say that we have never really, we have never taken baseline surveys to see what the condition of farms were before they entered schemes versus, you know, how they are five years down the road when your typical scheme ends. So can we say that agri-environment schemes aren't working? I think the jury is probably largely out because we don't have the evidence to say one way or the other because we don't have the measures there, we don't have the baseline against which we can compare. However, I suppose there is a feeling that, you know, biodiversity is reducing um, and that's that's not uh, been argued at the moment. So, um, you know, on the whole, our agri-environment schemes, you know, they're, they're, they're there and farmers are, are, it's optional for farmers whether they want to participate within them. So it's, it's not compulsory on them. So therefore we don't have every farm in the country participating in them. But also beyond that, I think in terms of the design and the implementation and the monitoring of our schemes, we've, you know, we've had challenges over the years. Um, we've often been, I think a little, but not very clear in terms of the objectives of the schemes, but also the objectives of particular measures within the schemes. And I guess if you don't know where you want to get to, it's very hard to, to know how to get there. Um, so, you know, I think we certainly need very clearly defined objectives for our schemes. We also need to make sure that the measures that we're implementing are the right measures. Um, and, and what we're seeing more and more now is a move towards results-based schemes. Um, so where, where uh, you know, I suppose administrators are not dictating certainly the, the measures that should be in the scheme, but rather telling the farmers who join the scheme, you will get paid according to the quality of the habitat you have at the, uh, or the performance, you know, your output in, in, a, in an agri-environment sense. Uh, you will get paid accordingly on a scale. And that seems to enhance the performance of these agri-environment schemes. And, and I believe there's uh, a new scheme just being launched today, which is, is taking that approach, uh, which will be the first time really that at the kind of wider national scale here in Ireland that we'll see that kind of results-based approach. Now, it's only, as I understand, for a somewhere under 2,000 farmers at the moment, but it is a step, I think, in the right direction. Um, you know, that, that kind of emphasis on, on results-based and, and linking payments to that. Just actually very much linked with that, a question has come in and it's, it's uh, from Anthony and he said, what do you think are the main social drivers which influence farm decision making regarding biodiversity promotion in Ireland? which I suppose is really tied with 
I mean, it's not exclusively tied with agri-environmental schemes, but they're very much related. I think there's probably a couple of things. Um, you know, there, there's certainly a financial element there. That and, and as I say, you know, some people go, well, you know, finances are almost a dirty word, but people have to make a living from the landscape and farm families have to be able to survive in, in rural areas. And I suppose that's going to be an important issue for some people. Um, then on top of that, I guess it's, our perception of biodiversity. I mean, we're all here today because we're interested in it. Um, but that interest has really been a slow burn over the last 20 or 30 years. You know, you're, I think people who had more diverse lands um, in the past, it, it may have been seen that they weren't being progressive enough as farmers even, you know, and there was almost a, a stigma associated, I think, with not having the, the neatest looking farm and, and biodiversity and neatness don't necessarily sit well together. So, you know, there's there's a couple of things that are going on there, but I think encouraging people to be proud of the diversity that they have is, is a huge thing and that society as a whole starts to recognise that, but also that we reward farmers appropriately uh, for the provision of that diversity because it's not their diversity, it's society's diversity as a whole. Yeah, no, I take your point, and that goes back to one of your finishing slides there in relation to the the, the multifunctional component of the of our systems. But really, there's only a monetary value put on one of them, mm -hmm. or maybe there's only a value put on on one of the aspects. Um, just, I suppose this is probably a little bit of a curveball for you. Someone has asked, how is this valuable information? So a nice compliment there. Um, be filtering into the green search to influence how the current and future farmers would behave in relation to, to landscape management and relation to field management. Well, I guess myself and my colleagues are um have certainly given numerous talks on the multi-species element of things and uh, we're trying to disseminate that information as much as possible and, and I've done the same um, with the, the habitat work uh, insofar as possible but I guess we can't necessarily dictate what goes into the curricula of uh, the green search and um, However, I do have a, a student at the moment who's, who's working with the level five students to, to understand or better understand their perceptions of uh, agri-environmental issues in general and their appreciation of it. And, and to get a handle on that, you know, that we can begin to understand how students perceive these things. And are we, I guess in the long ter longer term, or medium term maybe, um, see if the, 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 the way in which this information is being thought is, is having the desired effect on, on students. So we're, we're learning in that space yeah. Yeah, to yeah. our current study. That's very, very relevant indeed. Um, there's, there's a couple of other questions that have come in and I'm not going to have time to, to get to them all. So I'll, I'll just finish up with this one if it's all right with yourself. So it's pretty specific in relation to what are the management practices that would help improve the herb persistency in the sward. So getting back to one of the challenges that you highlighted, do, do you have any plausible solutions in relation to that? Yeah, um, we don't have any, uh, I suppose, definitive answers at this stage, only to say that um, the work is is ongoing to, to try and, and elucidate those those management uh, factors that are involved. So the things that we think uh, are important are probably around the rotation length and extending rotation lengths to allow the herbs in particular to recover between grazings because we know that ryegrass responds very well to regular defoliation but not all species well. So we have to give them a little more recovery time. Other things that we're looking at are the, the residual uh, sward type, the post-grazing residual sward type. So traditionally with a perennial ryegrass sward, you'd be grazing down to about four centimetres. So 
we're, we're leaving this, increasing this to about six centimetres to see if that helps with persistence issues as well. So those are two of the, the, the ways in which we're, we're looking at it. Um, we're also looking in another study again, um, the, the work in Delft, where we're uh, looking at a combination of fertiliser, but also using slurry. Um, to get a, a handle on how species respond to those and if they have, uh, if, if slurry would have a, a, an impact on, on persistence of species and indeed yield. So I think it's going to be quite difficult for us to come up with a management prescription that is as well tied down as the ryegrass management prescription. Um, because you're dealing with different species within a sword, you're dealing with them in combination. And there will be a degree of variability, I think, probably between farms and also between fields. And we'll have to, farmers will have to learn a bit in terms of, the, through their own experience of these, so as they, they become more familiar with them as well. But we do hope to be able to give, you know, better information in terms of rotation lengths and post-grazing sward heights in, in the near future. That's brilliant. It's a, it sounds like there's going to be a hell of a sort of, not a, something very challenging in terms of a knowledge transfer approach in relation to dealing with this, because as you say, it's, it's not just about a species, it's about a composition and how that composition varies within the landscape or within the, the farm that you're dealing with. So yeah. that's... Very, very awesome. interesting. Right. Well, listen, I, I will wrap it up there and I'll thank you very much again for a very interesting seminar and for handling the questions that were, were posed to us. I'd like to thank those who joined us online um, this afternoon. And I will wrap up by saying that we have a final seminar series um, in a number of weeks and it'll be Kieran Mead and he will be giving his seminar in relation to immunogenetics. So I will wrap up there and thank you once again for joining us. Thanks Barry. Thank you.